Hi everyone, it's Paul Tilly, and welcome back to another episode of Making Tracks. Today we're going to take a look at an interesting ride-hike combination. And if you're a plane enthusiast, this is something that you want to see for sure. What we're doing today is taking a ride from Clarenville to Burgoyne's Cove. And at Burgoyne's Cove, there is a crash site for a RB-36. It was the largest plane in the world at the time of its crash in 1953. So I'm going to show you how to get there. And first, I'll tell you a little bit about the story of the RB-36. The B-36 was a huge airplane. And there were two types of them. There was the B-36, which was a bomber, and the RB-36, which was a reconnaissance machine that wasn't used for bombing. The one that crashed in Burgoyne's Cove was a RB-36. Anyway, this plane was driven by six large propellers and four jet engines, and it had the nickname Aluminum Overcast. North America had a large air defense system that helped protect us against incoming Russian bombers and warn us in the event of a nuclear strike. On the 17th of March, 1953, a group of these bombers left the Azores and headed towards North America to test the air defense system. This was done under a cloak of secrecy, and only the, the leader in this group, General Ellsworth, knew what the project was all about. They flew through the night at a very low altitude, about 500 feet above the ocean waves. It was a very stormy, windy night. They weren't allowed to use any radio navigation, and their navigational sextants were useless because of all the cloud cover. They were supposed to enter North America around Maine. They would fly over Maine onto the final destination, which would have been in South Dakota. Unfortunately, the winds were so strong and the weather was just so bad that they ended up blowing much further north, and they ended up just over Trinity Bay. Unfortunately, the plane was so low it did not clear the hill at Burgoyne's Cove. Twenty-three men, including General Ellsworth, were killed in the crash. At the very top of the hill, above the crash site, you can find this monument that commemorates the 23 people that lost their lives that fateful night in March 1953. So the first part of the trip is a 27 kilometer trip along the trailway from Clarenville to Lethbridge. It's a well established path and it's really well graded. There's a couple little spots in it that are mm, got to slow down for it, but otherwise it is a nice little trip. So assuming you start at the Shoal Harbor Causeway, you can see here with this very quick view that uh, it's a pretty well established trail. Once you get down to Lethbridge, you've got to go up the side of the highway a little bit. And here we are going up the side. That'll bring you up to the main highway. And then you turn left, and it'll bring you to the Dunrovin. Dunrovin, beautiful campground, cabins, everything you'd possibly want is there. Across the street from the Dunrovin, you go down this street. road. It's the Lethbridge Resource Road. Brings you down 22 kilometers. And that's um, a nice little road. Let's take it here, and you can get a sense of what it's like. Some farms and things along here equipment along this road so be careful don't go too fast watch out for the dust make sure you got your mask on if it's a dry day but you can see that it's a very well graded well established road no problem this goes down 22 kilometers and eventually meet this intersection in the winter. so you'll turn right at this intersection this will head you towards Burgoyne's Cove so this goes through the the middle of nowhere really there's a number of cabins along the way lots of little ponds is nice again well graded well traveled road be careful yeah it's uh you know twisty turny so you want to ensure that you're safe here but otherwise it is a fine drive and there's some lookouts along the way maybe a place for lunch Eventually, you'll make it to an intersection just outside of Burgoyne's Cove, and you'll see this sign that says USAF RB-36. You follow the trail, actually, that leaves that route that we just came down. You'll see that you'll go in four kilometers, and it will bring you in to what used to be a slate quarry. You'll notice that I've illustrated the route with my cursor here, so you need to go through here. And you'll go to, you'll be going uphill here before you get to the quarry and you'll see a little parking spot. Once you get to where you need to go, you will see this sign. 
At this point, it's a half hour walk up the hill to the actual crash site. You start the trail next to the sign, it goes in and goes along fairly level, but don't let that fool you because you have to climb about 500 feet. So make sure you got good footwear and that you're up to climbing, um, say a 20% grade. There are some seating areas along the way, but not much work has been done on the trail lately, so those areas are getting a little bit shabby. It climbs up through this valley that we're looking at here now. And here we go, we're moving up now, moving up. And as you as it starts to get higher, you'll see a pond emerge there in the center of the frame. That pond is where you're aiming at. That pond sits about 800 feet above sea level. And the top of the mountain is about 900 feet above sea level. The plane impacted at 800 feet. So had the plane been flying 100, 150 feet higher, there would never have been an accident and there would not be a story to tell. 23 men lost their lives that night. And it's, uh, the site is uh, very much a, a scene of uh, mass destruction. Once you get up on the hill, you will see on the left of the pond, as we move in here now, uh, to the left of the pond, you will see the main wreckage to the left. And above the pond, you will see a uh, monument. What I'm doing is flying backwards here now up at the top and as you come up that trail you'll start to see pieces of wreckage and you can see as we fly over it now we have a wing component, some engine parts, parts of the fuselage, but the major part of the wreckage is located in this crevice. The tail section of the plane pretty much is the most recognizable part of the plane. And that's where you'll end up. 5113721 was the aircraft number and that those numbers were actually placed there by the Canadian Armed Forces who put the monument in place about 20 years ago. You've got to be mindful of walking around this wreckage. A lot of sharp aluminum there and so be mindful of that, but as, as anyone who's interested in airplanes, there's a lot of very identifiable parts there. For example, right here we have a, one of the propellers. This plane was unique in that it had six propellers and four jet engines. So they called it six turning and four burning. It's quite a large airplane. This debris field runs in through the woods and there's a trail that leads in through the woods and actually I'm going to bring you in here now and you can see various parts and pieces of the plane. The turret there. Part of the wing structure. And here is a shock absorber from one of the front landing gears or one of the main landing gears. So you go even further. There's some parts of the fuselage again. Part of the landing gear strut. Electrical control boxes. Then we have another fairly large debris field here of various fuselage parts. Another turret there. 
Seems like a section of the roofing structure. You can imagine the forces when that plane hit that would cause such massive destruction. Here's what I consider one of the most interesting pieces. This is a part of the front landing gear. And you can see the damage that was caused to its uh, components there. And you can just see the tire. The front tire is pretty much still intact. Keep in mind now, this has been in the woods for about 70 years. Now, above the pond on the hill, there's a monument, and the monument was erected about 20 years ago, and um, it's one of the propeller blades of the airplane. And on that monument, you will find each of the names of the 23 crew members, including General Ellsworth, who was leading the expedition, and General Ellsworth, actually Ellsworth Air Force Base in one of the Dakotas, is named after him. So you can see in reference here now where the everything is relative to everything else. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out the various links I have below to find out more about this fascinating crash.